And now I'd like to introduce Larry Melman, Vertex Tax Director and a member of Vertex's Chief Tax Office, who will lead today's session with Diane Yetter, President of Yetter Tax and the Sales Tax Institute. Larry? Thank you, Stuart. So we'll go through some of these slides. I'd like to um, just have Diane, why don't you give us a little background on uh, yourself so that we can, uh, those in the audience will know uh, who we are. Great, thanks, Larry, and I'm glad to be here. Hi, everybody, I'm Diane Yetter. I'm the president of Yetter Tax and founder of the Sales Tax Institute. We are a longtime Vertex partner. Um, our firm is celebrating 25 years in business this year, so we've been a partner all of that time. And I was also a Vertex partner at my prior role with Arthur Anderson. Started uh, the sales tax field, started in the sales tax field as a, an auditor for the state of Kansas right out of college. So I have been doing uh, sales tax for more years than many of you have been alive. I can definitely guarantee that. Uh, I saw Sue Hatfield say she stopped giving out the number of years. Um, Sue and I are about the same number of years of experience, uh, so I will do the same. So Larry, what's your experience? <laughs> well, I too, like you, I use the plus sign. So I just write 30 plus. It was great yeah. when I did 25 plus and I said, yeah, I better bump it up a little bit now. But the plus is always good to have. So uh, so my name is Larry Mellon. I'm the tax director in our chief tax office, uh, primarily working with our strategy on uh, working with our customers and, and potential customers as well on trends and writings and, and blogs and white papers about tax so that our customers can enjoy and understand a vertex perspective on that. Um, I've been in that role for less than one year. For the 15 years that I've been at Vertex prior to that, 16 years prior to Vertex, I was the manager of our indirect tax practice. So I was like many of the people that were on here, I was responsible and my team was responsible for preparing and filing all of our uh, internal tax uh, compliance. All right. So as we go through, let's go to the next slide here. Let's go through some of the learning objectives. Upon completion, we're going to be able, we're going to talk about, articulate the latest uh, state audit trends, preparing for audits. We're going to go through that. We're going to be how using the Vertex data can help us with that audit process. And we're going to get, go through some specific examples on there. And we're going to talk through some of the audit work papers. You know, what can you do? How can you uh, uh, reduce further assessments? What steps can you take? And we're going to kind of go through each of those things and certainly want to uh, get all of your questions answered as best we can throughout it. We do have a number of polling questions that we'll be going through, and we're going to hopefully use those answers based on those questions to kind of uh, drive where uh, we, pre we uh, present this uh, session. So it's really uh, helpful if you would please answer those questions and follow along it would really help us deliver um, good material and project product so our agenda you know we're going to talk for 15 minutes basically on covid how that impacts our budgets we're going to talk about the trends in audit but in two areas in the audit process and the assessment reasons we're going to go through each of those things and explain some stuff and then we're going to try to leave some room at the end for some q a now we may not have time for q a we, we have questions that are along the way which is fine but as, as Stuart had said in the beginning any questions you have please Put those in the chat as well. If we don't get through those questions today, uh, we will certainly be following up with you um, on those questions that you have. So as we move in, I want to just talk a little bit about engage, empower, and accelerate is basically what Vertex, this is our theme for exchange for this year. So we're just asking everybody to keep mindful. This is where we're trying to go. We're looking for everyone who's pretending this session to continue thinking. This is where we're trying to go. We're trying to engage you in a session, empower you, and accelerate all the processes and, and compliance that you have. All right, so now we're going to the next session. We're going to start talking about audit trends, and I'm going to turn it over to Diane. She's going to start us. Great. Thanks, Larry. And it's always a pleasure uh, to come back for this session with Larry. We've done this together, Larry. I was trying to think, how, this has got to be what? Six, One seven, plus. eight? <laughs> plus. <laughs> Just see, plus. plus, it's been a number right. of years. <laughs> right. It's been a number of years, yes. Right. So when we are live in person, we usually um, try to really get a lot of engagement, which is why we've got more polling questions than probably most of the other sessions. And that is our opportunity to get your input. So please participate in those polling questions and um, uh, that, that will gear what um, Larry and I actually talk about. 
Just briefly, um, a little bit of an impact of COVID on the state budgets. When we were together a year ago, Larry, if you remember, we were uh, not quite sure what exactly was happening, although it looked like all of the fears from the spring were probably not going to come to fruition. And that is exactly what we saw. So as of earlier this year, uh, more than half the states, 29 states, have o had overcome their pandemic-driven losses. The states that we uh, continue to see uh, have losses are uh, states like Hawaii and Nevada that are very tourism uh, driven. Although I was in uh, Las Vegas last week for uh, the cost conference, their annual meeting and uh, Las Vegas is alive and well, <laughs> lots of people there. So they are certainly going to start uh, recovering. And then Alaska and Texas with uh, their large uh, reliance on oil because nobody was uh, driving. So gas prices and, and the impact on fuel needs and requirements is what really drove those two states to have uh, losses still. Um, you know, sales tax initially was down um, until everybody figured out how to sell online, which has certainly accelerated the number of taxpayers that are now having to be registered and collect due to economic nexus in the Wayfair decision. Um, we did see shifting of income tax and then uh, gas prices reductions uh, because the uh, demand on fuel had uh, tumbled the way it had. So we saw a lot of states having a reduction in gas taxes since those are often a percentage of the uh, gas prices. And then obviously gambling and amusement taxes, those are still uh, suffering some. Um, in addition to uh, the decreased revenue, the other impact that really affected the budgets were the costs of fighting the virus and the need for additional state services. However, all of the federal funding that came through really helped to recover uh, or help the states to recover from those costs that they incurred. And so that is where we are also seeing a lot of that turnaround. Um, now, obviously, the increase in e-commerce, we service uh, a lot of e-commerce businesses that the revenue just accelerated at a pace that I don't think anyone really expected particularly in certain industries. Uh, restaurants, if they were able to figure out how to shift to the delivery model, then that helped them, although clearly not at the level that they wanted, but that is certainly something that has helped offset that. Um, what we have seen in the fiscal 22 budget, so now most of the states are into their fiscal 22, is there are some income tax reductions, but there is a higher focus on indirect taxes. So I think Larry, in your new role, this will be real interesting to see what you see coming in um, uh, for new uh, policy decisions and initiatives. I think that'll be real interesting to see. That's correct. Yeah, we are taking a look at that. Um, you know, so certainly what are some of the responses that the states had? Some of them were budget cuts. So we have seen that, although in talking to some of the different uh, states, uh, my home state here in Illinois, they are actually uh, staffing up on auditors, so they are increasing some of those. Uh, rate increases, we have seen some of those, although I haven't seen any proposed state rate increases, but certainly the local rates continue to just proliferate. Vertex does a great job of tracking all of that. We, we love your annual uh, report of all the rate changes. But the thing that I think we're going to see happen a lot is this base broadening. And for any of you that were in the session uh, that happened just before this one with legislation, litigation, and regulation, you saw some of the discussion about uh, digital goods and digital advertising and some of those base broadening. And I think that's what we're really going to have to keep an eye on. And as uh, I think it was Sue talked about, the state of Wisconsin was trying to reclassify SAS as telecommunications because Wisconsin does not tax SAS, but they do tax telecommunications. That is an indirect way that the states go about base broadening simply by interpreting things differently. And that is something that is a big impact in audits. And so that is one of the things that you're going to really have to keep an eye on as the states are coming in and trying to make their assessments under audit. Make sure that they are uh, sticking to the definition. Now that Wisconsin issue, uh, good news out of that, 
Wisconsin is a streamlined sales tax state. And so the taxpayers went to the streamlined governing board and said, you know, Wisconsin is doing this uh, reinterpretation. And because telecommunications is a defined term under streamlined, uh, the state actually lost and, was and Wisconsin just recently came out and did agree to abide by the governing board ruling. So that is something that is going to be very helpful. And then the other thing that we're seeing is narrowing interpretation. So we see base broadening, but also narrowing interpretation. So that's where the states are coming in and for particularly exceptions and exemptions that they are narrowing who, who qualifies. We are seeing states get stricter on the acceptance of exemption documentation or proof of tax payment by your customers. And that is a way of narrowing those interpretations. And then all of that kind of comes to play in what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today, and that is audits. And so whether or not we are seeing an increase in the number of audits or the increase in the enforcement of those, so the, uh, taking those base broadening and narrowing interpretations and figuring out how to keep the states, you know, kind of honest in what they are doing as they go through the audits. So, Diane, just wanted to add, I mean, there's people who, um, you know, who get that report on sales and use tax. And we talked mm -hmm. about, you talked briefly about the rate increase. So what we're finding for those who really didn't look at that is that we're seeing like pretty much across the board that there was, I believe there was zero states that, incre that increased their sales tax rate. But it was something like 150 new local jurisdictions we're set up with taxing. Yep. So we're starting to see more taxation at local level with compliance at the lower level through all these, you know, counties and, and uh, MTAs and all these areas are being set up. So even mm -hmm. though we may not be seeing an increase there, we're definitely seeing more local tax rates and compliances increase significantly. Exactly, exactly. And I just saw a question come in, Larry, on that Wisconsin uh, situation. Cindy asked if Wisconsin taxpayers who were assessed on SAS apply for a refund. Cindy, I would assume so. So if you were assessed, as long as the statute of limitations is still open, um, but feel free to shoot me an email and I can see if I can find out if there was any prohibition against that. Um, so I can talk, talk about the next. Do you want to look at the next question? So there's another question as well, or do you want to just move on, on and Pennsylvania? go back? Pennsylvania. Yes. Um, <laughs> I can talk about it if you want me to talk you about. You want to address it. that one, Larry? I wasn't <laughs> going to put you on the spot on that one. <laughs> No, so, so of course, in Pennsylvania is our home state. So, you know, we certainly, uh, James has a question on here, recently got an audit assessment where Vertex Consulting was deemed taxable in PA. The state said it was CAN software support. I'm wondering what Vertex thinks about that. We didn't expect to pay. So what's basically happening is that Pennsylvania decided in August of 2016, Act 84, which basically said support services, what's considered consulting was considered part of the total purchase price. So uh, take a state like Texas, and if you buy software from one company and buy the support from someone else, it's non-taxable. But if you buy both the product and service from one company, it's taxable. And that's how Texas spells it out. PA really didn't go down with that. They were considering support. And most people think of a professional services as not support. So we're finding that there's more and more people who are going through this and determining its taxability. So um, I think that there are still people who are arguing that with Pennsylvania Audit. I'm not sure how they're doing. I haven't been through that to know how Pennsylvania comes back. Um, but again, it's up, you know, when a person looks at its mapping, you have to look at both the services and products of making that determination. So just wanted to comment on that. All right. Um, so one of the things that we're seeing as trends in indirect audits and, um, you know, we are, as our consulting business and through our teaching on the Sales Tax Institute, the remote seller audits, this has really started to pick up. <clears throat> You know, ever since the Wayfair decision came out and states started enacting economic nexus provisions, the question that I kept getting is how are how are the states doing? Are they being aggressive? Are they coming after taxpayers yet? And early on, we didn't see a whole ton of that activity, but it has definitely picked up. 
And so we are seeing many more states come after remote sellers. The thing to keep in mind is we are right now just at the point where we had the first larger group of states in act in um, October of 2018. And given that many of the states, their statute of limitations is three years, that was my projection, is that right at about the three-year mark is where we were going to start seeing those audits start to escalate. And that is exactly what's happening. We certainly have some states like Maine um, and Massachusetts that have been sending out notices almost from the beginning. Keep in mind, Maine was one of the ones that was effective July 1 of 18. And then Massachusetts with their cookie nexus, which luckily has been repealed at this point, but that was effective as of October of 17. So remote seller audits, I think, are just going to continue to increase. I think now as the time period, as we roll into more and more states becoming effective, we are going to see more and more states start to audit those. The other thing that we're seeing is that the states are being really picky on exemption certificate requirements. And that is something to really make sure that you are on top of. Now, one of the, the bright lights on exemption certificates is through Streamline. So for the 24 participating Streamline member states, there is actually some protection against or protection for the seller if they receive a completed certificate. And if you get that completed Streamline certificate, then you as the seller are no longer liable for any uh, evaluation of uh, does the exemption exist in the state? Does the number match? Is it the right format? As long as you have all of the key data elements filled out, then that is going to be a protection. We also just saw the state of Idaho come out with a legislative change that is shifting the requirements for proving that they qualify for the exemption to the purchaser. So they are kind of aligning with um, uh, with uh, streamlined on that. So watch for that. Um, and then the other thing that we're starting to see is that the states are really going after this reconciliation. They are trying to tie your sales that you report on your sales tax return to other source documents. So whether that is line one of your income tax return or uh, tying out to your income uh, to your uh, financial statements and your general ledgers. And if there are differences, that then they are assessing that difference. And so when we look at the various different states and how they are going through trying to figure out what the specific or what the right number is that you should be tying to, watch for how you are doing that. There's a lot of companies that only report their taxable sales on their sales tax return and not their gross sales, or at least not gross sales into the state, which is what, you know, the systems, you know, Vertex returns, that's what they're going to do. They're going to put your gross sales in the state on the return. And so that is something that you definitely want to watch for, because that is a tough thing to try to dispute and get over if the state really goes hard on that reconciliation. All right, so let's do our first polling question. So what has been your experience with auditors during the pandemic? So has nothing changed and your audits have continued as they have been? Um, your audits are continuing, but at a little bit slower pace. Uh, radio silence, your auditors have disappeared or you aren't involved in audits. Larry, I know that you changed your role uh, partway through the pandemic. What, what was your experience with audits that were being done of Vertex in your prior role? Oops, I don't know if we lost Larry. Uh, looks like we may have, nope, we lost Larry. I think he may need to refresh. It looks like you're frozen on the screen, Larry, if you can hear us. All right, I wasn't sure if it was me. All right, 
right. Jeremiah, am I back? Am I good? Okay, Larry is frozen. All right, so I will have a discussion with myself. So we are getting close uh, to the number of people, so we'll give it just a couple of seconds to answer this. Um, you know, what we, what we have been seeing is, um, you know, initially we saw things slow down. Um, a couple of states, we've got uh, a Texas audit that was going on uh, that really, really slowed down early on in the pandemic. And then we also had uh, a Kansas one that has gone a little bit slow. So, all right. Um, why don't we go ahead and we've got about 86% in. Um, Jeremiah, can you close the poll? I am not sure how to do that. All right. So um, it looks like the audits have continued um, either at a, a regular pace, uh, about 23%, and then about 57% have continued, but at a slower pace. And we do have a small percent of people that the auditor has disappeared. So um, maybe if you're in that 5%, why don't you let us know in the, in the uh, Q&A what state has disappeared on you guys for that? All right, so now let's go ahead and, um, you know, what we heard uh, early in the pandemic, so, you know, definitely closer to spring and summer of 2020, states were saying that they weren't going to initiate any new audits. I actually heard that specifically from Texas, and then I actually had uh, a Texas audit uh, reach out and want to get started, which I thought was kind of interesting. But certainly, you know, as the states needed to get more revenue, uh, the audits was a good way to go about doing that. But initially, what happened was the states, although auditors worked remote, auditors typically worked remote at a taxpayer site. And so that made it a little bit challenging for the state to figure out how they were going to do that. But certainly the auditors were the most technologically equipped because they all had laptops and Wi-Fi and the ability to work remote. Um, it was just that they didn't necessarily have some of the things like the e-audit rooms and some of the uh, more sophisticated electronic communication and secure communication that we're seeing rolling out. A lot of the states said that they would uh, accommodate taxpayers with limitations on access to records. As the states um, have uh, released and opened up their work from home requirements, we are starting to have uh, more of the states say we're ready to come on site. However, one of the things that you really have to keep in mind with your business is, are you letting uh, non-employees onto your site? Um, while I was at the cost conference last week, you know, there was some interesting discussion about whether or not if you couldn't do the plant tour, how could you go about doing that? And, you know, somebody said, well, you know, why don't we just do a video tour? And turns out that because of security reasons and confidentiality, that they don't allow uh, any cameras or phones even in their facility at all. So that is something that they were not able to do. They had to go through a bunch of hoops, uh, negative testing, proof of vaccination, different sorts of things like that, in order to allow the auditor to actually come in to do that tour. Um, but early on, we also did see that if you were fairly far along in an audit, that there was uh, efforts by the auditors to close those audits in order to get some cash in the door. We actually were able to negotiate kind of a, a pretty uh, successful uh, audit reduction. There were some open questions that were, you know, in that gray area where we were able to go in and say, look, if you can let this go, we're willing to pay. And uh, a couple of the states did jump in on that. So that's something else to think to think about. All right, so let's talk a little bit about audit volume. So comparing 2021 to a pre-pandemic typical prior year, do you have about the same number of open audits? You have more open audits or you have fewer open audits? So let's see how this is going. And while you guys are answering there, um, I think we still have lost Larry. So let me, while you guys are answering, oops, while you guys are answering, I am going to take a look at some of the questions here. 
Um, so. Okay, a couple people have said that they're having problems with polling questions, so hopefully you have seen those. We are on, I think, our second one. Um, all right, Colette asked a good question. Have you had trouble with auditors accepting electronic certificates? Um, we have had a few states disallow them and said they must be physical copies. Colette, I have not had a state refuse to accept um, a digital copy of a certificate in, gosh, it might be more than five years. Um, the key is, are they readable? So if you did scan them, um, was there something that made it so that you could not see them uh, clearly would be the only thing that I would say uh, would be the issue. So I'd be surprised on that, but if you wanna let us know um, uh, which states, that would be great. Um, Clint also said, does the seller protection apply to the MTC certificate as well? Um, it applies to the streamlined states, uh, Clint. Um, my experience has been I try to always use the streamlined certificate. Um, there is, you know, discussion whether or not using the state-specific certificate or the MTC in the streamlined states would give you that same protection. Um, I just really try to, to go towards the streamlined one. Also, um, I am working on a task force with uh, streamlined on certificates right now, and they are working on some modifications of that streamlined certificate. So that will actually uh, help a little bit more. All right, we'll give it just a couple more seconds on the... Um, on the uh, polling. So if you want to get your CPE credit, make sure you do that. Uh, Brenda mentioned that Wisconsin is being aggressive on that reconciliation that I talked about just a few minutes ago. Um, I have had that problem with Wisconsin. I've also had it with Illinois uh, that they really try to tie those out. So thanks for that feedback, uh, Brenda. So, all right, why don't we go ahead and let's close the polling question. Jeremiah, if we can, and see how people are doing with audits. Oh, maybe. There we go. Okay. So uh, we've got about 45% of the people have the same number of open audits. 24% uh, have more, so that's interesting, and then 30% have fewer. So hopefully those fewer ones have actually closed uh, some of those audits and have so far escaped some new ones starting. All right, so let's do one more polling question. Um, how have you been able to resolve audits? So comparing this year, 2021, to pre-pandemic, have you closed about the same number of audits we have closed more audits, we have closed fewer audits, or we haven't been able to close any audits at all this year. Um, so let's see how those are going. And I'll look for a couple of additional questions while you guys are doing that. All right, uh, Saritza asked a good, interesting question on certificates. Um, if the customer has a DBA and that is the name on the certificate, is that typically accepted or must the legal name be on the certificate? I certainly always try to recommend that they put the legal name and the DBA name. What I would say is I have had uh, issues with states where the uh, name on the certificate does not match the name that the seller has in their records as that uh, customer name. And so that is where I try to have both of those. I've also had one situation where um, we got an exemption certificate. Or no, we got a uh, let's see, they, we hadn't charged tax and the customer said that they had self-assessed but they wouldn't give us their registration number and the state could not find the name in their records at all. So they refused to accept that. So I always try to put both of those on there, uh, Saritza, to just protect myself for anything else. Okay, so audits have actually increased by a couple of people. Okay, interesting. 
All right, uh, let's give it just another couple of seconds. Uh, if you haven't voted yet, remember you need uh, four CPE. I know that this is more than three, but this is really helping, um, especially since I don't have Larry to talk and bounce these things against. Um, so let's go ahead and we've got a few more people voting and then I'm gonna go ahead and we'll close this in just uh, three, two, one seconds. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and close that. And so we have about 46% have closed about the same number of audits. So that's pretty impressive. That's actually higher than, than I was uh, expecting. About 11% have closed more audits, and that kind of aligns with what I was talking about, that, that in the pandemic, we did have the ability to close some of those audits uh, a little bit quicker. And then those of you that have closed fewer or haven't been able to close any, that could be with those auditors going on radio silence. So that is certainly something uh, to, to be aware of. All right, so another trend that we're seeing in audits is where is the audit being conducted and how are they being conducted? And so with most of the business records being maintained electronically, even you know without the aspect of the pandemic, a lot of the states had moved to reviewing electronic data more than actual paper records. And that's something that, you know, I have been, what, what I have been a fan of is looking at not necessarily transaction data, but focusing more on my taxability rules. And that's one of the things that if you're using Vertex and you've got your uh, uh, taxability rules set up within your Vertex tax calculation system, that that is a great way to think about trying to approach doing an audit. Certainly the auditors are gonna have to cross check and do some checking, but I've actually tried to really push towards, let me show you what I've got set up and how I've done my classification and how I am taxing items rather than looking at how am I processing transactions. Now, certainly with the pandemic, the states are really relying on e-audit functions and being able to use those e-audit rooms more so, and they are finding it to be very successful. Um, in fact, at the uh, cost conference last week, we had a tax administrators panel. We had California, Texas, uh, New Jersey, uh, Georgia, I think. I, I'm trying to remember who the last one was. And that was what they were saying is that the e-audit rooms and the remote audits had been going so well during the pandemic that the states were really going to use that as probably their primary way of doing audits instead of actually sending auditors out to the taxpayer's location. Now, in the manufacturing space or in areas where a plant tour is really necessary, you may still have an auditor come to do that aspect, but they are going to want to do as much of the audit remotely as possible. Now, I'm torn on that. Um, you know, there is part of me that some of these audits that have dragged out a little bit longer, I actually had a fairly junior audit uh, auditor assigned to an audit um, from Texas. And you know, he at the very beginning, which was right at the beginning of the pandemic, I think it actually started in February of, of 20. He said, you know, I want to get this done, you know, as quickly as possible. And then we um, and then all of a sudden the pandemic hit and he totally went silent and we didn't hear from him. We'd email him. He wouldn't respond back. And when we finally got a hold of him, he actually said, you know what, I just have a really hard time staying motivated. You know, I'm so used to being out at the taxpayer's office. Um, and this was an audit that he wasn't doing at the taxpayer's office even beforehand. And it just, it, it was hard on the auditor to do that. So that is something to kind of be aware of that you may have to do a better job of kind of touching base with your auditor and setting up regular touch points uh, to check on them. All right. But one of the things that can impact that is what is your company policy regarding providing auditors, uh, providing records to auditors? Um, you know, there are some companies that refuse to let any of their records be uh, uh, 
disseminated in any way, paper or electronic. They only allow them to be viewed in the offices. Um, some taxpayers, larger taxpayers, have actually set up their own e-audit portal. And so they will do an electronic audit, but only using that, not using the state's. Um, some people are a okay using the state audit rooms or do you not know, have any policies or you don't know what your policy is. So let's see how everybody treats this um, within their business. And while you guys are answering, I will look for a couple of additional questions. Um, uh, Carol asked, um, are we at risk if our non-reported sales are not taxable sales that we can support with documentation? So I think that goes back to when I was talking about the reconciliation process. And Carol, the issue is, is if the state is attempting to reconcile, let's say your total gross sales off of your financial statements to your specific sales tax return, if you don't have um, a way to show what those non-taxable sales are and that they tie out totaling with your, with your taxable sales to equal your gross, then that is where that delta that they are potentially looking to assess. And so you wanna make sure that you, you can do two things. One, that you can tie out your total sales between taxable and non-taxable. And then secondly, that your non-taxable sales that you can actually document why they are non-taxable. So if they're due to exempt customers, you're going to want to make sure that you've got your certificates. If they are uh, due to exempt products, then you wanna make sure that you have those classified um, appropriately. So those are some of the things that you want to make sure that you have the ability to do so that you can um, uh, avoid any of those assessments simply due to um, not being able to tie those numbers out. All right, so we'll give it just another couple more seconds for answering the polling. Um, all right. Um, so Drew asked, um, he's had a lot of state auditors trying to reconcile back to our tax return gross sales. And there are a number of differences though that we've been able to provide to the auditor. Some are receptive and others are not. Can you elaborate on best practices? So I think the best practices that I've been able to do is really to number one, if you know, what are they reconciling to? If they're trying to reconcile to your federal return, if you are a particularly a multi-entity, so you file a consolidated federal income tax return, you just have to tell them that there is no way that they can do that because that includes sales for entities that are not currently under audit. They may then push you to look for a uh, pro forma type of uh, return, and I would push back against that. And so what I would try to do is really limit them to looking at your, your general ledger that has the sales for that entity. The other thing I would do is be careful about using your uh, apportionment schedules. Sometimes that works because it is your state specific sales or in your sales numerator, but make sure that it is, you know, is it uh, gross sales or less returns and allowances and uh, watch for that. The other thing watch for is if you have anything like deferred revenue or if you have subscriptions that get spread out over a period of time, watch for those timing differences because those can really uh, play havoc with trying to do those reconciliations. All right, we're at 82%, so let's see what your guys' policy is. Um, so, gosh, that's higher than I was expecting. So about 45% are fine using the state e-audit rooms. Um, and then uh, there's still a few people, three and a half percent, that can only view, will only allow records to be viewed in their offices. So it'll be curious to see if your company policy needs to change on that uh, with COVID. Um, and then there is 11% of you that are providing electronic records, but in your own e-portal room. Those of you that don't have any policy, um, you may need to, um, you know, think about what that policy is going to be. The ones that are in, uh, pay, uh, in their own office are typically the industries that we see this with are um, uh, uh, government uh, 
contractors, so government uh, people that are selling to government agencies. Uh, also, healthcare is another area that we have seen in financial services that they are very restrictive on what they can see. Sorry, Diane, I'm back. You're back. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, Chuck, on that. I do think that there's just really comment those last two uh, sections, the 19 and 21 percent, with the policies yep. that I think that people really need to step up and figure out what they have and get those policies in place because they're going to save you considerably when it comes time for audit to recognize what you have and and you could potentially have significant exposure by not taking that time and figuring that stuff out. So yeah. so that's roughly 40 percent of those who took the poll that basically don't have that information and you, and you should really uh, work on getting that information as soon as possible. Right, right. Great, great point. Yeah. All right, and we've got another polling question of historically, so pre-pandemic, how did you conduct audits? Exclusively in person, hybrid, so it would start in person and follow up electronically or exclusively remote. So Larry, when you were running audits for Vertex, what was your policy? So we pretty much had it in person, be able to, to bring them in. And, and I, w I can't say the whole audit. Primarily the initial conference was always in person, meet them, meet the supervisor, kind of have conversations on what they're doing. And then we would kind of base our decision on how we were going to proceed on how that meeting went. Was it something that was hybrid? We could get it. What were, what were those jurisdictions agreeing? When were they going to give us information back? Were we using a portal where we put it? Were we using a state jurisdiction portal? So a lot of that stuff. So we start, we started out in person. We nine times out of 10 went to a hybrid just to okay. make it easier. Um, some jurisdictions said, well, the person's already here. They're working on it. Do you have a place for them? Because a lot of times they want to send their auditor out. And then, of course, then the question you could always ask as well, is that auditor just working on my audit while they're in right. my space? Or are they working on other audits in my space? So it, it varied. But mostly everything would go towards a hybrid. Yeah. You know, and I, I was an auditor back in the mid-80s. So certainly electronic records were nothing that we did. But um, what we you know, what we often found is they were almost all in person, except when we had out of state audits. Sometimes we just couldn't finish them in the time that we were on site. And then they would have to send us records. And, you know, sometimes it was on a, you know, on a disc that they would send us. Um, but often it was, you know, copies of invoices that they would ship to us. And so it was really kind of interesting. All right, so let's see what we've got here. So um, look at that, almost 80% yeah. are hybrids. Yeah. So that is um, that is definitely interesting, but still 10% are exclusively in, per in person. I think yeah. as more states do remote sellers, that exclusively remote is going to change. I just don't see yeah. states coming out and doing in person on a, a remote seller. Do you, Larry? Yeah, I agree. And I think that, you know, many of the, you know, depending on who's in that role, they want the exclusive in person because they, you know, maybe the mindset where we take the auditor, put them in the furthest away, watch them like, you know, some people have that mindset that things aren't electronically. But I, I do agree as this pandemic starts going, we're doing things more in rope, that's going to increase and the exclusively in person is going to greatly decrease. Yeah. So we saw how people have been doing it. Now let's see, what would you like? So if you could completely decide and be able to dictate what your audit would look like, how would you do that? And um, we've gotten a couple of comments in here on that reconciliation issue that we talked about. So a couple of other states that people mentioned are, um, let's see, we've got... Um, uh, Texas has been requiring, so Sandra mentioned Texas was doing it. Kentucky, Nikki mentioned doing a reconciliation to the income tax return. Uh, Paul indicated all of his new audits have been from Texas. Um, Texas has been pretty aggressive. California uh, from Jim, they're doing the reconciliations. Um, uh, let's see, is there anybody else? Um, all right, so Kenneth asked, what do we mean by an e-audit room? Uh, definitionally, um, Larry, have you, 
because you've probably worked with them a little bit more, right? With um, some of the different states, how would you define an e-audit room? So, uh, you know, many of like, so we potentially had one where we would set up one that was secure on our site where we could go in and we could dictate what someone is able to see, you know, whether we were able to give them access to exemption certificates for a jurisdiction, or we could set up a room that, Everybody who's compiling, you're reaching out to AR to provide invoices, you're reaching out to AP to provide invoices, you're reaching out for fix that. Everybody's putting it into one e-room and then you're able to classify who has access to each of those areas, the auditor included, where you would put things in a folder that just the auditor could see. On the flip side, the jurisdictions come in and they want it to be on their site. So we have used both of them and I have used both, both ours as well as mm -hmm. jurisdictions. And they've both worked fine. Um, just become preference on what you what works for you yeah all right so interestingly so i'm going to go back because yeah we were 10 percent down the two okay. right we were 9.9 .9 down, down to 2. 2. 79 yeah. hybrid down to 43 and this is our big jump yeah, so it looks like people yeah. really from 11 to 53 yeah yeah, a, a people really want those audits to be done remotely. And you know what? Having the auditor not underfoot is really, really great. But I think the key is you need to set those touch bases with the auditor because otherwise they do out of sight, out of mind. Um, and then what you get, you end up with sometimes the auditor will reappear and say, all right, the statute is just about to expire. So we need to do this very quickly. Um, so we're, we're getting a little tight on time. So let's uh, focus a little bit on what are the reasons for assessments. So certainly um, if you're B2C retail, it is going to be classification and rate issues. I had an audit for California that was um, uh, exclusively on classification. They, they weren't registered. It was an Amazon a seller with inventory in California. So it was because of that. But we waited a year and a half for California to validate our classification. And as to what was food, what was a supplement, what was candy, what was, you know, these different uh, classifications. So that is certainly what you're going to see in the B2C. In the B2B goods here, it's really gonna focus on exemption issues. So is it for resale? Is it uh, manufacturing? Is it a uh, R&D? How, how are the goods used? That you're going to see much more as the issue in your B2B audits. And then if you are in the service business, there it is going to be classification. So what exactly is the, is the service? Is it taxable? Is it not taxable? And then the sourcing issues. Um, you know, particularly if we think about things like SaaS and software and multiple points of use and where is the software actually being used versus where is it being invoiced to, that is one of the big issues that we see in um, assessments on services. Yeah, that's huge. Oops. I went too far. There we go. So what are the reasons that you have had assessments? Um, are they coming up because of taxability interpretations, customer exemptions or missing exemptions, sourcing tax rate errors? I'm hoping that we're going to see very little of those, right, Larry, from our, yes, our Vertex yes. customers, because right. Vertex does a great <laughs> job of that. Yep. Um, tax calculation errors. Um, again, hope we're not going to see many of those and reconciliation issues. Um, so let's see what those are. And then um, we've got a lot of questions about certificates, um, some specific ones on, uh, you know, can we, uh, do we have to have wet signatures on exemption certificates? I don't think that I've ever no. had one um, disallowed for not having an original signature on that. Uh, digital signatures are okay, but you've got to have a signature of some sort. Um, right. I don't know that I've had anybody disallow it if they just typed the name. Have you had that disallowed at all, Larry, versus uh, it looks I, like it's a digital signature? I have, because especially when someone submits a multi-state. You know, I've seen some where someone submits it and the signature says accounts payable typed in. <laughs> like it's because it's they're like they're providing the 
get out a tax free card so it's playable and it's just typed in there so i have had some people have come back at, at previous employers where they've come back and said, no no who is the person that's actually signing for this to validate that so okay and we have seen that um okay. i did want to comment while i'm waiting for the poll for a second you know sarah mm -hmm. talked about california issues with auditors disappearing when we talk about doing these audits and and that's key with having this automated with e-rooms back and forth that's you have more bandwidth to be able to work on this get the stuff to them but come back to them and say Here's the day I notified you. Here's the day it was in the e-room. You didn't get back to me for two months. When we start talking interest and penalty, let's talk about the two months you didn't touch it. And 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 yep. they're negotiating things you have when you're when you're doing your uh, negotiating with the owner. So that's a key thing. So all right, so yeah, I think we and, want to kind of see where we're at. Okay. Yeah, sorry. and and on that, uh, California, if you um, if you can prove that the audit was delayed because of the auditor, yep. they will pause interest that that audit yep. that I that just talked about. Yeah. That year and a half, we got big chunks of, of months stopped for the audits. So, all right. So, biggest, mm. two biggest ones, taxability, customer exemptions, not at all surprising, followed by reconciliation. So, I think those are, yeah. you know, the, the biggest things that you're going to see out there. Yeah, the taxability interpretation, which gets different, gets crazy, is just because you have all the tools in front of you. It's how the auditor perceives it and how you read it. And we all, everybody on here reads tax language and it has the word and or if or but in it. And yep. that can completely change that whole thing. Yeah. So let's do the next one. What are you most worried about with your audits? Is it aggressiveness of the states that there's just the volume of the audits? States are less willing to settle. Are you nervous about remote audits and not being able to have, you know, one of the things that I always love about audits is being able to sit across the table and get to know, you know, have that water cooler type of talk time with the auditor where you can get to know them and you kind of lose that with the remote audits or is it just everything? Um, while people are answering there, Sheila asked, um, with virtual audits being considered so successful, do I anticipate states closing their various offices outside their states? You know, that's an interesting concept, Sheila, and I've wondered about that. You know, I think there's a couple things that come into play there. I think uh, states that just have uh, auditors working out of their homes, they will continue to allow them to do that. Um, but I think the ones that have actual offices uh, here in Chicago, we've got about 25 states that have offices out here. You know, I think depending upon the uh, the lease term, <laughs> you know, that is certainly going to be something that will come into play. And depending upon the state and what the the state that the auditors are from and then where they are sitting, it will depend on probably how much um how much need there is for an auditor to go physically to see like a plant to do a plant tour. I think if there's a lot of facilities that are um, in states that the, uh, that the out of state audit is, is doing, they will probably retain those there. So. Yeah. And I think just quickly on that too, Diana, is the fact that if there is a jurisdiction that has made a significant tax change, they're certainly going to utilize that auditor more in that state. You know, because there may be areas of tax that those customers are not aware of and they have a chance to get at them. Mm. Yeah. All right. So. All right. All right. So everything wasn't the top, which I think it has been in the past, Larry, hasn't it? Yeah, it has um, been. So aggressiveness of um, of the states. Interestingly, no one is concerned about remote Zero. audit. So that is Zero. that is good to see. That is good. Um, yeah, I didn't think it would ever be at zero. All right. Um, so let's see. Um, so a couple of things, you know, the the budget shortfalls we talked about earlier, but some of these lower hanging fruit things that we're seeing the states go after is remote sellers registering late, um, stricter exemption certificates, and then penalties we're seeing are a little bit uh, tougher to get out of. Um, but what we have seen is and, and because of that, what you may want to consider is really watching for amnesty programs or participating in voluntary disclosures. Florida just closed an amnesty program um, at the end of September, and that was for remote sellers 
particularly those with uh, inventory in Florida, that it was a full forgiveness of inventory um, in in full forgiveness of tax, sorry, for uh, presence of the inventory in the state. Uh, watch for Connecticut. That is coming up starting November 1, and that will run through January of 2022. We're still waiting for the specifics to come out on that. It should be coming out any day, uh, but definitely consider that. And then voluntary disclosure programs, um, particularly if you are not registered or you have exposure, um, there are some states that are still willing to do some deals for remote sellers, if that's what your situation is. Um, but you know what we've also seen is there are a lot of taxpayers that thought that they only had economic nexus, but turns out they actually had physical presence, and so their econ- or their nexus actually predates the economic nexus. That's where a voluntary disclosure program can really come in handy to try and get that uh, resolved. Um, these are the states that we have seen come after and start being much more aggressive on remote sellers. Uh, California, Illinois, Maine, Massachusetts, New York, Wisconsin, New York, and Illinois uh, more recently. Uh, we've got, I think it's three clients under audit in New York due to economic nexus uh, strictly, and Illinois has started doing that. Uh, Wisconsin, I think we've got two under that. Um, California was was really going after the uh, Amazon FBA sellers, and that is um, you know something that you really need to watch for. Um, so a couple of other things um, to just kind of pay attention to is the COVID impact. So the uh, remote uh, employee, remote employee locations that there may have been some nexus uh, forgiveness or uh, relaxation on that. Some of those are starting to go away. And keep in mind that those only applied if your nexus was being created due to physical. If you exceeded economic nexus, that did not help you at all. And then certainly, you know, uh, electronic records is helping the states continue to uh, close audits. So with that, I think we got through it all, Larry. We've got maybe a couple yes. minutes for, for some more questions. Yeah, we did. We, we I mean, we actually had 58 questions come through the chat <laughs> and we're certainly not going to be able to get through all of those. And we'll certainly try to. Uh, yeah, I will definitely be reaching back and we will be able to talk to you about those questions. So um, let me see if I can just think, pull a couple out of here and see if we can kind of answer some that were on here. Um, so like Heidi had said, are we seeing auditors willing to let you correct exemptions? Yes, usually they do. If you have one that's expired or out of date, they'll generally allow you to reach out to that uh, customer of yours and get a valid certificate. Uh, is generally what happens. I mean, I guess they could be hard, but most times I've seen them, they've been fine with presenting that back. 